Well, I'll say one thing. You're all uh, quite uh, easy to manage here. Uh, I'm Stuart Levy, and I'm happy to welcome you to the third and final panel. Uh, with Dave France, I serve as co-chair of the International Working Group, which, whose team here uh, worked to put this together for the NSABB and for you all. Uh, this third panel is not going to be with an example, although when I think about what came from our previous two panels, I think when the question comes up, how do you define dual use research of concern, I think one can easily say you do it by example, where we heard that before. So this now allows more time for open discussion on anything that's gone this today or anything you want to bring up new. Uh, we'd like to keep the questions short, the answers short, so we can accommodate a lot of uh, different ideas and different concepts. Be nice to come up, and we'll try to steer, steer it, if we can, with a some sort of final remarks as a result of this and what you might think about it in terms of uh, who has the ultimate uh, goal, who has the ultimate decision on dual use research of concern, uh, with whom rests the most responsibility. I think we've heard different uh, variations on that and maybe we should be thinking about that as well as other areas. Uh, my co-chair here is Rob Ployd and I think we'll let Rob begin with the questions and comments we'd like. Thank you, Stuart. It's been a, a very stimulating afternoon so far to uh, hear, I think, very useful case studies as a basis for discussion rather than being entirely theoretical. And this last session is a, an extended period of discussion, and we really do encourage uh, participation by those in the audience. Uh, don't be afraid to cue at a microphone, because that gives Stuart and I clear evidence of how much demand there is for speakers, and we will then manage the time accordingly. We do have a number of questions on the program that was sent out, but we do want to move within the realms of the dual use research of concern constraint into the areas that would be most profitable. So the opportunity is open for those in the audience uh, and also for those in the, the, uh, the panel to steer the conversation into the most profitable areas. But just following on then from uh, the presentations we've had and the discussion we've had about the case studies, can I just pose to the panel as a whole, what then should we be doing you know, as we move forward from this place? We've had some examples of the past. They could be best practice. They might not be best practice. So panelists, what should we be doing? And whether the we is scientists, journal editors, government officials, security community, you know, what is the way forward on this issue? Anybody want to kick off uh, this discussion? A very open question. Even and I cannot believe that so many scientists are short of an opinion. <laughs> okay, please, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, I think a useful metaphor for thinking about the dual use problem is the image of the dual use pipeline. So there's the, the main concern about dual use is that there will be malevolent use of scientific knowledge or technology that ends up causing great harm. And so the main aim of things that are done um, in the way of oversight, governance of dual use, and so on, the main aim should be to prevent such harm. And so the, the image of the dual use pipeline is therefore useful. The du dual use pipeline goes like this. First, a research project is conceived. Maybe it's recognized at that time that there's dual use potential, that the research might lead to danger a dangerous discovery. That's one possible spot of intervention. Um, the research is taking place. Discoveries are being made. Maybe dangerous discoveries are made. Maybe dangerous discoveries that weren't envisioned as possible when the research was first envisioned. Might be time to publish the study 
that's another potential spot of intervention in the pipeline. Um, uh, Dual-use discovery is published. There's potentially dangerous information in the public arena. Um, there's uh, you know, dangerous you know, materials that could be used to make dangerous things. Controlling who's, who has access to those materials is another potential spot of intervention. Um, and then, you know, there's things like, you know, controlling what, you know, governments are allowed to do, you know, things like the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, and, you know, that's another possible spot of inter intervention. So there's this whole pipeline, and there's different places in that pipeline where interventions could be made. I think it would be a mistake to think that there's one spot which would be the right place to intervene. There's an, an idea of the web of prevention. We need various things to happen um, rather than relying on any one kind of intervention. And the hope being that with this web of prevention, inter intervening at these different places in the pipeline without being you know, too controlling at any one can achieve a balance between the aim to you know, promote science, um, scientific advance on the one hand, and security on the other. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Ramshaw or Dr. Dennison, does this concept of a pipeline of consideration uh, make sense uh, in your experience? Uh, I believe a, the, the process or pathway um, does. Um, I, I, I I, I think the term we're using may be a little different, but I, I think the concept of, of generating something uh, dangerous, I, I, I prefer to, to use the, the concept that uh, as, we evaluate, as we evaluate the materials, um, seeing a potential for misuse doesn't mean generating something dangerous. That's, a, that's a, to me, a little bit of a different thing. So I, I, I would just maybe uh, differ a little bit in that. But I, the concept of a pipeline, a parallel pipeline, is good. I think that a a prospective one that engages, as I've said, that engages those stakeholders along the way allows allows for a sort of a collaborative assessment of of those risks as they may accelerate or they may decline based on based on results that are generated. So it, it's a it's a different kind of of model for research and also removes, I think, some of the pressure from the idea of dual use, right? Because that's a term that even with dual use of concern added, and we can add other words on the end if we want a real concern. Um, we're, we're in a position for trying to sort of make a black and white determination. Does it meet that? And I believe that most of these things aren't quite in there. So these functioning with like the NSABB or other things as guidelines, looking at those with the stakeholders and saying what's their level of concern with each of these different things is I think a really good, I, I, I would concur that the process is a good one. And most scientists, I believe, when they're engaging in something like this are in a position now to know early that there is something of this that might come, that there may be surprises with the ultimate outcome, but they're not surprises with the process because it's a too complicated and time consuming and requires support, requires funding, requires engagement of multiple investigators. So I think that the times now would suggest that a process is a really good way to go. Uh, thanks. I, I, I have no problems about this pipeline, but what I would like to counter Michael with is does he think there is any research at the start of it that should not be done? We haven't addressed that, and I just wonder if you can think of a scenario, or the panel can think of a scenario, this should not be done. I don't know if any researcher has been told or suggested that this work should not be done, but I would like to hear, is there any research of dual-use nature that should not be done? I can think of lots, but... but Ian, Ian, you know that this whole discussion began with a report now called the Fink Report, in which there were seven examples. I'm sure you know about those. Were you thinking of expanding that further? or? being more realistic. But, no, those are only issues of concern. But is there such a concern with research in a, a research area that this panel would say it shouldn't even be started to be investigated? 
is there such an extreme dual use concern that someone has to step in and say, you cannot do this research? So it's not just answering the question. For me, I look at biosecurity and biosafety as two different entities. Safety is the product, and what's it going to do? It's going to kill people. Biosecurity is how do you get there? What do you have to do to get there? And how do we keep that information secure so it can't be used by others? So when I read the Fink report, I'm really thinking about what am I actively doing, not in the product. So I'm trying to clarify, and I'm taking too much time on that. So Michael, you want to pick up from there. But that's that, I just wanted to make that so most of us are familiar with that document. I can imagine studies that shouldn't be published, and I can imagine studies that no one should be allowed to publish. I can imagine studies where uh, the, fi the, st the findings of which um, should be censored by government if, if necessary. And, and the kind of study I have in mind would be a study that, say, um, you know, led to a discovery of an easy way to make a pathogen every bit as de deadly, contagious, and untreatable as smallpox. Would I say that such a study couldn't be, shouldn't be done? I'm not so sure. I'm not sure that a study like that shouldn't be done, you know, in a classified environment. And so I'm not sure if I can imagine a study that shouldn't be done or not, but I can certainly imagine a study that shouldn't be published and a study that no one should be allowed to publish. This uh, question, I'll be very happy to see any views from the floor. Uh, personally, I'm a little surprised that there would even be a question as to whether there conceivably could be work that would be recommended not to be done. I always ran with that as an assumption. Um, when I read the Fink report, et cetera, is that that was the assumption that I had, that there were you know, possibilities, particularly with the seven deadly sins, I mean, the seven uh, areas of research that one should not conduct. Um, um, I, I read that as something which would be a preclusion of research, or at least, uh, if you went into it, you'd need to have good justification as to why, and that the outcome would probably mean you won't be publishing it. Um, but it would need a strong context. But happy for those from the audience to participate in this issue, and others from the panel, This, I think, is a key issue. Are we just talking about considering the security implications but never saying no? Is that what we're saying? Ian, you want to pick up on that again? I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if anyone knows of an example where no was ever said. I mean, I can imagine from my own field that if, the, if anyone presumably in high security lab wanted to test out the IL-4 in a smallpox, a virus to see if that was as bad as it you think it was, or if it was in a cowpox virus, a, a monkeypox virus. Any of those examples would be, to me, something that should not go ahead at all. In other words, not absolutely no way that they, sh they those experiments should be undertaken. Those are the examples I'm giving you. I've got lots of other examples which I don't want to touch upon until someone else brings them up. Any other comments on uh, this well, issue? Well, I think to me, most biomedical, uh, most research in this domain, first of all, there's some built-in safeguards like peer review, and you have to get the resources to do it. So those, those may stop more effectively than any committee uh, possibly could. Um, but I think if people are moving forward, and the question is about fundamental questions in, in, in replication and pathogenesis, if they make sense, if they address a question, if they're high impact and they have significance in the field, the kind of things we review at the level of, of peer review, then they should be considered the question of should they be modified, uh, does that work need to be done in that system? Uh, can it be done more safely or in a more limited fashion would be kind of the way that I would view those particular things. Um, I think that um, the concept of someone presenting something that they know is going to be shot down and they're going to be told they can't do it, I would think there wouldn't be too many surprises 
if someone did that. At least there shouldn't be if they've been, you know, appropriately educated, and they shouldn't be able to do it independently and on their own. So I, I, I would guess those wouldn't pass muster. They wouldn't be surprises for people, would be my opinion. Yeah, I, I think what I read is that the examples are those that would put those kinds of re dual research of concern. Whether or not they are, ever be practiced or not depends on other circumstances surrounding them, like giving permission but with a different animal or a different group of cells or something, but at least drawing attention to the fact that there could be a malevolent result from that. Dave? Yes, I think this is a, an interesting question. Uh, However, I think uh, also the good news is that over the last 10 years, as the global community has considered these issues more carefully, uh, I believe that uh, most scientists and most organizations would have a more measured and a more reasoned approach uh, to, to these uh, kinds, of, kinds of studies and would want to really make sure that they're very important before they would put them forward. Jeffrey? Uh, I think we're talking obviously about sort of one extreme, and I think it's been has, been has been raised. There are checks along the entire process that would discourage most of that, that kind of activity. But just to come, come back to the idea of the, of the pipeline um, and, and, and what, what's happening now, what we should be doing, we've made some strides in terms of journals uh, recognizing the issue uh, putting in place processes to, to deal with it, to identify manuscripts, et cetera. And it's actually been, been fairly gratifying to see the amount of progress that's been made. But one of the things that we, we find out when we talk to journal editors is that they don't like being the sole or the major gatekeeper. Um, they accept that responsibility by and large but they feel uncomfortable with, 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 with that responsibility solely placed on them and are very, um, are, are very interested in, in upstream uh, sort of uh, considerations that would deal with the situation before it becomes a manuscript and appears on an editor's desk. And so the, the issue of uh, study sections, the funding agencies, program, keeping up with, 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 with the project and, uh, and, and experiments that may have not been initially proposed but are now being conducted as a result of, of, uh, of results that have been obtained. Things like that uh, are, seem to be very much worth considering, not in a way that would be onerous or burdensome or would inhibit uh, sort of the, the creative and innovative um, uh, life of, and, and activities of scientists, but one that would help uh, get to it so that when it gets to the point of a publication, um, it's not a surprise. It's been considered all the way along, and then ways of dealing with responsible communication uh, are, are a little bit easier to, uh, to formulate when, when the process has been one that, that involves something like the pipeline you're describing. There is a key issue that we've been dancing around in the earlier session today and now in this session and that is, who says no? You know, we heard earlier that this is probably an inappropriate thing for an IBC to determine. They should be more advisory. The NSAWB is an advisory board. We now hear that journal editors would prefer not to be the one that has to say no. So to the panel, who then should say no? Any views, uh, Mark? You, you uh, made some statements, I think, around the IBC, that not being its role. Well, I, I'm rather pugilistic, so if I don't want anyone to tell me no. But, uh, but I, I guess in response to re uh, reviews from the Pelcor of our, of our paper and of a project, we, I, I established criteria. And I actually promulgated these to the, to the journal also and let them know, and because they had asked me well, I don't know what to do with this. Should we do a separate review? And I said, sure, that sounds like a good idea. Do a separate review. Here's some names of some people that you might do in terms of a biosecurity or dual use review that you might want to do before you do peer review to be sure you want this paper to even review. Um, but the idea, if it's, if it's accepted or based on a process um, in terms of recommending withholding of information, we would use that as a process to test and approach um, 
of the synthetic biology to human health. Based on reviews and comments alone, we would not unilaterally redact, remove, or, or withdraw any portion of the manuscript. We would require rapid process of review and concerns even prior to considering limitations. Investigators and CERCEB would take the lead in requiring additional scrutiny and review at a higher level, the NSABB, NIH program, independent scientists and journal editors. In absence of classifications, we would not agree to non-publication of the science. Um, and, and I think we said that in terms of the idea that we felt that if that process moved forward, that it, that it needed to be more inclusive and involve, involve more people, because then the, then, the, then the questions become larger questions and are beyond the individual investigator or the institution. And so there's a process, of, again, of learning there. And so, and partly that was a bit of a, a straw person to put out there in terms of, of, of how we would view someone telling us we couldn't do this, that, we, that, that wouldn't be okay. I won't do that. I would want to understand why, and I want to understand the implications are for policy going forward. So, Robert, I think it's a great question, and what I wonder is, is can you really say no? Can anybody say no? And we, we live in this age where, where information is so easily distributed in such a rapid and, and massive way, um, it, it's kind of like trying to, uh, you know, plug the, the leaking dike. But what seems to make more sense is to um, educate scientists and to help them realize that there are tremendous incentives for responsible conduct and communication of, of what we do. And I think someone said earlier, earning the public's trust, uh, maintaining the public's trust, and, uh, and behaving responsibly is, is something that is, is uh, certainly incentivized, or at least it should be, in, uh, in our society. Thank you. Amy. I was wondering if the panel could um, spend a few moments talking about what, practically speaking, can an investigator do? We sort of say publish, don't publish. It's kind of a binary decision. But as Jeff points out, this work is conducted primarily in an academic environment. It's a very porous environment, very open. Um, so in some ways, it's almost meaningless, and not quite, but close to it, to say don't, don't publish. So then what are we really talking about when we talk about um, managing communication responsibly? Um, could somebody put some very practical language or, around that? I, I, one, one way is, uh, is to approach the experimental design up front, and um, a few people have mentioned, but that requires recognizing the issue up front and maybe using a different cell line, doing the experiment a little bit differently. Um, that requires a lot of foresight about where the trajectory of the research, which we don't always have. Um, so I just would like to hear uh, people's suggestions about, practically speaking, what does it mean to re be responsible about the communication of science in an open academic uh, environment? Um, I guess I could try to answer uh, part of that and, and maybe coming back also to the question that you raise in terms of who says no, and it seems sort of in the traditional uh, academic paradigm of conducting hypothesis-driven research, I mean, we do have currently um, uh, long-standing uh, instruments, such as the scientific review process, again, a pure, pure review process, and then on the other side, the ethical review process. Mm -hmm. So these are actually the current um, uh, review processes that, as academic scientists, you already have to face. And, and it might be um, more useful to, to uh, expand, well, not expand or, or embed, no, that's not a good word either, but uh, in terms of having dual use research concerns be be formed or part of the formation of those considerations i think would be would be more useful in one practical consideration because that's essentially what happened with ethics i mean it it's, it's nice to think that we were just humanitarian and as researchers wanted to do good which we do but actually it was um, egregious uh, uh, events conducted by the few that actually drove us to put in the safeguards that we have for human subject research, and and I see pro probably if, if we were to evolve that way, the, you know, there might be similar considerations for this type of research as well. So I think at that conceptualization stage, as well as writing the proposal when you submit it to the 
the, these um, framework review committees that, that whatever mechanism that you have institutionally, um, that awareness raising process has to occur uh, at that level. Um, then the second aspect, which I think the last case study raised really well with, is that in addition, so there are two aspects. So there's the ethical aspect, which I think seems to be sometimes overlooked or sidestepped in the security imperative is, is the technical aspect. I mean, um, uh, you had sort of the weight and the, the, the benefit of, of your colleagues and, and being able to call on policy and ethical experts to help you. And in addition, you also had the technical capacity to, to kind of evaluate the specificity of your research and say uh, what was the potential of that and, and actually really do, I guess, what, what is sort of a risk assessment, um, an, an actual a credible risk assessment of the technology uh, that then allowed you to make that decision. So I'm not sure that, that we are, um, for the most part, I don't know, in, in the region, able to access that, that type of uh, uh, technical capacity to make those technical assessments. So that, that would be an area, I think, where I think you talked about creating networks and, and creating collaborations to, to help inform each other to make those um, sometimes difficult decisions. So are you implying that Amy's question dealt with communication? that it doesn't just deal with communication to the outside world, but it's communication within the scientific groups. And that this is what's a big plus from doing it in academic settings where you have the brain power and, and all the experience of your colleagues that could do it. That, that's also what I meant in saying that the scientist, him or herself, is best able to judge if the idea of dual use research of concern is aware to that person. And I might say that in the years since the Fink report and the establishment of the National Science, the NSABB, that knowledge has been moving pretty quickly. And in fact, there are more and more people that understand that. Dave and I had the first uh, international working group meeting and the idea of this concept, how do you teach it? How do you talk about it? Who's gonna take care of it? Some of the same questions here, but I think we've come a long way. I just want to press this a little bit more. Let's say we have an experiment that was judged to be scientifically meritorious. It was done under appropriate biosafety and physical biosecurity precautions. It was done for uh, legitimate reasons, both uh, heuristic and perhaps beneficent, with an aim to advance public health. But the the results of that research are judged to meet the criteria of being dual use research of concern or beyond. Then what does the investigator do with that? Because the purpose of the research was to advance knowledge and to improve public health. So what are available mechanisms for communicating responsibly in that setting? Oh. Oh. Uh, a crazy thought on this, uh, I don't know uh, how to put it. See, the thing is, uh, uh, if we have the, a practical uh, approach for, for this would be, you know, that's, uh, some sort of a communication between the journals, the publishers, and the author who is going to actually uh, submit his paper. So there could be a certain part of uh, so maybe experimental design or methodology. You know, there could be a part of it which uh, the journal would say, you know, in view of this uh, security concern, you know, uh, it's not being published. However, uh, any individual who would be interested in this may actually contact the uh, author and, uh, you know, the, have his own uh, this thing and then uh, and leave it at that. Because, see, the thing is, uh, uh, a scientist or a person thing would, all be, would be more interested in actually showing the people the results that he has got more than what the moment, because methodology is more for the reviewer. Uh, to actually, you know, judge uh, whether the procedure has been done correctly or not. So we need to have certain kind of a mechanism with the publishers or with the uh, journals. You know, the, where you, because many times it happens where whenever there are patenting issues involved, uh, they necessarily don't give any, you know, maybe uh, sequencing uh, their uh, sequencing this thing, and then you know they may just keep it with them, and then uh, they may be asked to refer to the author. So maybe. Uh, in some cases, maybe this can also be taken care of, you know, like, uh, I don't know, this, uh, maybe 
the actual researchers who are there, they may be able to comment on this better. But then this could be one of the way out of to have some sort of a balance, you know, in this. Isn't that really the experience, the lessons learned from Ian Ramshaw's um, discussion? The, you know, the same result has two sides. The same result is beneficial. And then you can also see improper or destructive uses of that result. And so they chose to publish in the open literature those elements that were in fact beneficial and chose independently and or working with the journal editors not to, you know, publish other aspects. So that ultimately it, it came down to the individual responsibility of the researchers. Um, and in this case, I guess, uh, Jeff had let the editors off the hook by giving them, uh, you know, the answer uh, to the questions that, that, that they themselves were asking. I mean, it seems like it's almost if you use even the original, you know, nuclear research um, in the 40s, um, or even before the 40s, um, where certainly the original scientists who were looking at those questions knew they were going to be developing very beneficial um, technologies for energy production and what have you, and they, and they also feared other uses of the same results. Um, so I guess that, that moves into another question of who knows, who, who is it who has enough background information to know the, um, the malevolent uses. You know, perhaps even when you're looking at your own research, you know, you haven't come, you, you came to it for benefic beneficent purposes, you found beneficent results, and you don't really have the capacity to see, you're not a suspicious person, you know, to see the malevolent uses. Um, Rob Floyd got into that a little bit um, in the very first panel, actually. Um, Dr. Yuan, you've been incredibly yeah. patient on the line. I wonder if there's anything yeah. that you wish to say on this issue. Yes, I, yes, I would like to take the chance to say some words, you know. And, you know, the dual use research is very, very difficult to identify the, from different point of view. So that is why also dual use has been recognized since the 17th century, but just the, during the past decades, it, it increased the understanding of this uh, uh, dual use research. But very recent, but anyway, very recently there is a, a lot of some some papers is recognized or identified that the dual use research. I just heard, I just noticed that there are three papers on the re, uh, laboratory reassortment or reassortment between the avian H1N2 and the pandemic H1N1, as well as. Uh, H5N1 and H3N2, and it created some resortment, resultant with increased pathogenicity. So I think even in the past few few months, a, a Dutch scientist made some mutation of var H5. One virus is causing the virus to become extremely infectious, and it was possible to change the H5N1 into an aerosol transmission virus that can be easily be rapidly spread through the air. But I think, furthermore, with the development of synthetic biology technology, maybe some synthetic microbe will be constructed with the objective for green chemical production and polluted water treatment uh, and eco ecology construction and so on. And surely some synthetic virus might be appeared for well understanding the pathogenicity, evolution, reassortment, interaction in host and virus. So this synthetic virus or microbes might have some impact on public health, environment, agriculture, national or international security. So that it, we needed to take some action to control or supervising this kind of research and uh, take some measure to prevent the 
release of the sense, this kind of sensible of information. The problem nowadays, even in China, you know, the biosafety and biosecurity philosophy is recognized by Chinese scientific community. But the dual use research is not totally recognized. So we needed to have some measure or some special program to raise the concern of principal investigators through training. But this one thing, I think, that the scientific ethics is most important since because the principal investigator is responsible for this kind of research. And he should know, he should understand what is the purpose of his research, what is the benefit of his research result to the public and to some others. But second thing is I think we should have a, some criteria and checkpoint for scientific, for, 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 for scientific funding review. Otherwise, if you have no scientific funding, you can do any research implicated, implicated uh, related to the dual use. But the third thing I think is that the publishing body, it should have some, it should have the peer reviewer or editor have some responsibility to evaluate or identify some potential impact of the sensible information on the environment, public health, and so on. But most important things, I think, is the regulation. Nowadays, even if we have, we have issued some regulation on biosafety bio and biosecurity, but this regulation just focus on the basic biosafety and biosecurity issued and some requirement. But there is no regulation, even in China, there is no regulation on the identification of some dual use research. And there is no regulation on the classification of research and classification of information. So I think it is really to do the international cooperation, and we already co do the cooperation with some international organization like WHO or some others to establish the international standard or international regulation to, 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 to standardize it, some procedure or something else. This is my point. I think, thank you. Dr. Wang, thank you very much. Uh, you made some very important points. In fact, one of the questions for the panel and for the audience have been what uh, current science and uh, security measures are in place anywhere in the world, particularly in Asia Pacific, because that's where our examples come from, uh, that mm -hmm. our examples are examples of moving towards a generalized understanding and should there be a limitation in communication, but at least who are these people or what are these institutions? And um, if th there are, as we see, representatives here, well, certainly on our panel, in terms of what organizations, what institutes, what government uh, organizations are in place, let's say just in the Western Pacific, to look at this particular uh, problem or issue and have some act to play in disseminating information and certainly the awareness. So in, the, in, in Indonesia, what you're in a very important position there what what goals what uh, avenues what methods do you have to bring forth recognition of the dual use and is it an individual organization is it the individual how is that decided but in China I think there is some institutional institutional biosafety committee who can this is in China. Some. This is in China. Okay. If you summarize, yes. then in China you have that. We're moving the discussion now to another in the in the same area, in in terms of Indonesia, and mm -hmm. uh, perhaps also in Singapore. We just get an idea regionally about what are the common features and uncommon features of approaching and publicizing this area. Yeah, I have no comment. 
Thank you. So in Indonesia, the uh, concept of uh, biosecurity, biosecurity, eh, sorry, biosafety, biosecurity, bio risks, and world use research of concern uh, was introduced by many stakeholders, many governments, uh, MOH, uh, Minister of Agriculture, uh, Minister for Research and Technology, and others. Indonesian Bio Risk Association tried to put together all of the government to put into one. So we have one uh, aim, the One Health, uh, uh, involving many stakeholders, and how to actually address the issue of dual use research of concern. We are involved, also we send some people actually to uh, have a training on uh, dual use uh, with the University of Bradford who have the module. I have been communicating with them and they are with us uh, on our launching of the association. And we would like to actually translate the dual use uh, module for the Indonesian. So we are going to have a pilot project in certain university that could be actually uh, used as uh, uh, our trial how they acceptance and how they are going to um, do that kind of things. Uh, so I think that's, that's, I think we have to, in Indonesia, we have to do it slowly. We have to do it in a many different kind of university, different region, different culture. So even in Indonesia, one size does not fit all. That's very interesting and actually a very important point. And in other parts of the, of, in that area, are there other countries that are, you're working with, uh, Malaysia, uh, Japan, uh, in terms of, prop, uh, of publicizing this area and helping others to understand what is meant by dual use research of concern? The dual use research of concern was actually introduced by our colleague from Japan, who actually, uh, communicating with us during the BWC uh, expert meeting. So all of the concept actually given by uh, our Japanese colleague. Uh, one of them are actually uh, uh, now actually working with the University of Bradford, Malcolm Dando. So it's kind of like, well, that could be used as well uh, to, to introduce the dual use research of concept in Indonesia. I'm particularly happy about that because Professor Dendo was with us in our first meeting. So uh, this is what our group was wanting, is that there be regional acceptance, regional cooperation. It would move. And um, that's the major point was the awareness. But how you reach the individuals, what methods are the best, I think is what you're saying. You'll find out what's best for Indonesia and whether it'll be best elsewhere will only come from those people working there who can see what's happening in your group. Can we steer the discussion a little bit uh, further down the direction? We've heard about the Bradford University and, uh, and uh, Malcolm Dando's work. Are there other resources, platforms, training material, et cetera, that uh, different players have found useful in this uh, biosecurity dual use space? Other, um, other resources? Uh, I have the resources also from the Institute of Defense, Japan. Uh, they also have a training module that actually could be translated and uh, could be uh, gathered on online. Is that, can you comment on that? Uh, recently, we started the discussion on the issue of the dual use research in concern among the members of the uh, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare and the Department of uh, Defense, uh, National Defense uh, Department. And uh, I heard that the uh, training course uh, on the issue of the dual use research concern was initiated in the university uh, medical school, medical college for the self-defense forces in Japan. And um, my comment is uh, to promote the recognition of dual use research concern should be 
imp uh, imposed uh, through the Academy of Science of Japan. Uh, you know, uh, this kind of biosafety and biosecurity issues are regulated by the infectious control law enacted about 10 years ago in Japan. Uh, but the dual use research concern is closely associated not only with the medical uh, scientific field, but also in the, in the agriculture and uh, chemical or nuclear something. So I think that this kind of uh, problems or issues, dual use research concerns, should be regulated under the regulation uh, under the code of conduct declared from the Japanese Academy of Science. This is my recommendation. So you, you can talk... I, can I just raise a question on that? With the Academy of Science in Australia, we try to introduce, because the Academy of Sciences in Asia are very, very closely connected, they have interactions with all the academies, and we try to get this Julius issue raised with the Academy of Science in Australia to take it through Asia. And the fact that it's come up now, it would be an opportunity if we wanted to develop this further in the region to get the Academy of Sciences in Asia involved because they are very, very close-knit organizations. And certainly the Academy of Science in Australia was very supportive at that stage. The person who was running it eventually left, sort of fell, fell, fell by the wayside. But I would suggest if you wanted to do something along these lines, the Academy of Sciences would be the opportunity, uh, opportunity there. Ian, would you put that at the top of the list of a source to propagate this information? I mean, there is WHO and people have different opinions about the effect WHO could have. But here you're taking local societies, professional societies of top academic leaders, and just like in medicine, key opinion leaders are looked upon to tell us what. I think that's what you're saying about the national academies, is that if they were to take it on, they'd have tremendous clout. That's really quite true, Stuart, and the advice that I got from our academy of these people who work with other academies in the Asian Pacific area was that, yes, they are very closely knit, and once one starts doing it, then others do involved. So it is a strategy. How successful that strategy, you won't know, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very, I suspect, useful strategy for this. Stuart? Yeah, I would like to add also about that, about the Indonesian Academy of Science. This will be, a, uh, this is the first year that the Academy of Science actually uh, developed Indonesian uh, Code of Conduct for Biosecurity. That's following, uh, we are working together closely with the Royal Netherlands Academy of Science, who is developing the Code of Conduct. And also we're trying to get the National Academy of Science actually to support us. So this is part of the uh, activity. And of course, dual use was actually introduced before we talk about code of conduct on biosecurity. If I could uh, just give others opportunity to talk about platforms that work for advocacy, but uh, before and while you think about your answers, um, can I say to the floor, if you have any questions or, or uh, comments that you want to make, please go to the microphones. Uh, we'll never stop otherwise. So um, the time could run out. So please indicate your interest by going to the microphones. Um, you know, we are watching um, and uh, we'll uh, get to you in just a moment, sir. Um, we've heard this issue about academies of science from a number of uh, countries. How about other countries, India, Korea, um, you know, what mechanisms work best for advocacy in your countries? And then we'll go to you from the floor, sir. Uh, in India, actually, uh, most of the biosafety-related uh, issues uh, uh, so far, including the guidelines uh, which they have formulated for this thing, has been done by Department of Biotechnology, uh, Government of India. It's a separate department which actually uh, starts with, uh, you know, uh, 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 
giving all the sorts of recommendations uh, as to how the genetically modified organisms uh, should be uh, handled, uh, right from the institution level right up to the national level. So there are different committees for uh, this thing. For example, review committee com uh, at national level, it's a review, com uh, review committee on genetic manipulation. And then you also have, you know, uh, so they have got all sorts of this. So Department of Biotechnology is one of the this thing. Now the thing, what happens is National Academy of Sciences uh, of India, uh, usually the members who are the, of those, uh, they are also part of these uh, di different departments, you know, and they are actually um, uh, high level officials, you know, our scientists uh, in this. So maybe the, it, it would be a good suggestion. However, uh, we have the even uh, Academy of Sciences also, we have got three uh, different academies. We have uh, National Academy of Veterinary Sciences, National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, and then we have got National Ac Academy of Sciences. So because the, they have all different uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, approach towards uh, research, you know, because uh, agriculture sciences and veterinary sciences is more practical and uh, appli applicable application research, whereas the National Academy of Sciences works on basic research. So there are the various, there are different, uh, different differences even amongst these academies. So Department of Biotechnology is one which actually, you know, can be uh, in, from Indian uh, perspective, you know, who can actually take part in this. Thank you. Dr. Kim, anything uh, you'd like to add from Korea? Uh, dual user research concern never been an issue in Korea. Uh, probably uh, not many uh, researchers uh, are aware of these uh, concerns. Uh, they think this is not really belong to me and also maybe someone else. Uh, but sooner or later, it should be really a big issue in Korea. I'm really sure for that. And uh, uh, societies and uh, Academy of Science, they all the time involved in other issues, biosafety, biosecurity, and also uh, code of conduct. So this issue, uh, I'm sure that uh, Korea will be get ready. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, a comment from the floor, please, your name and uh, affiliation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gerald Epstein. I'm with the American Association for the Academy of Science, uh, Advancement of Science. I'm not, we did not just merge with the National Academy. Uh, <laughs> uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, and some points in particular I wanted to, to, to push a little more on. We all come back eventually to education and awareness. It's impossible to be against education and awareness. Who wants scientists dumb and, un and unaware? But I think in looking at the value of that, it's important to distinguish there's two different problems we're worried about. And one of the difficulties is that they're related. But the one problem is losing the public trust. Best way to do that is to have a bunch of scientists blundering ahead without considering the consequences of their work, scaring everybody to death with good reason. So if you have educated and aware scientists, you at least have a defense against that. You can say, we thought things through, we've deliberated, we've considered. If you have the processes in place we've talked about, you can point to that. We're not going off half-cocked. There's a method, there's a rationale, and you have a hope of protecting the public trust. But the other problem is information, which once it becomes available, helps people do very bad things to the planet. Information which empowers terrible acts of terrorism. That's sort of the reality and the other one may be the perception. So let's say the public trusts this. Go back to the, actually what the damage of having dual use research of concern done is somebody may act on it and kill people. So here, in terms of the value of education and awareness, I'm saying, let's say we have our dream world. Every scientist is educated, every scientist is aware, everybody understands the implications of their work. We still have fundamental scientific questions that will probe these edges of dual use research of concern. You can't not. We're studying pathogenesis and disease. You still will have the possibility that research will be put into the domain where it can be abused. So my question is, if we have an educated and aware planet, what difference does it make? How are we safer? What bad things no longer happen? Dr. Ramshaw, your question was exactly on target. What research, having a sense of awareness, do we not do? And Dr. Patterson was talking, and some of the others, we're discussing there may be ways to, to modify a research, different strain, different model. I, I'm, I'd like to have that played out because I think 
that may not be a whole lot of there there. It may be that the fundamental question you're asking inherently brings these dual use questions into play, and the fact that you did it on this species of mouse and not that rat may not change the fundamental nature. So let's assume we're all educated, let's assume we're all aware. Why is this a safer world? What is it we're not doing? Forget about the public perception, they trust us. Should they? Gerald, excellent question. We'll, we'll just um, take the second uh, speaker from the floor while the panel think about their response to this question, and then uh, the panel can respond to both, uh, both inputs. The third one we'll take in a moment. Uh, Joe Canabraki, thank you very much. Uh, maybe my comment will segue a little bit to Jerry's comment. Joe Canabraki, University of Chicago. I'm a voting member of the NSABB. I just wanted to comment uh, on the discussion you had a little while ago about experiments that shouldn't happen or don't don't get done. And, and I just want to say that you know there are mechanisms in place at the local level with institutional IBCs wherein they d determine that the appropriate facilities aren't pl in place or training or whatever. And IBCs do say no at, at times. But on a national level, and, and that doesn't mean that experiment can't happen at all. Uh, on a national level at, in the US, the, you know, NIH, RAC, OBA, and the Select Agent Program uh, do limit uh, certain types of experiments, the major actions experiments, if you will, the, the restricted experiments of cloning uh, drug resistance into pathogens uh, for clinically relevant antibiotics. So there are types of experiments that are not allowed. Uh, and I guess the question to you then is, are there other categories of experiments that should fall into a similar uh, pathway of review, if I should say? I mean, we have the Fink experiments on the one side where the IBC is asking these questions, but can we come up with categorical uh, 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 descriptions where you know, we, would, we would really limit or restrict experiments in these areas? Joe, thank you for that question. So to the panel, uh, we've got the two questions. We'll hold the third speaker just for a moment at the floor. Uh, are we in a safer world because we're all educated and aware? And uh, the second one about other categories of, of experiments. Uh, Dr. Miller. Yeah, that, that's obviously a hard question to answer. But in relation to the first, uh, the first uh, question slash comment, um, identifying something as dual use research of concern doesn't necessarily mean the, the work should not be done or should not have been done. Um, the first question is, obviously, should it be done? And the second is, well, if, if it's been done, how should it be responsibly communicated? And just as identifying that category of research is, is, is often in the gray, and that's really where the, uh, where, where the challenge lies, is dealing with the gray, um, there are multiple options in terms of responsible communication once something is identified. A manuscript can be published uh, almost intact, as, as, uh, as we heard from, uh, from Dr. Dennison. Uh, commentaries can accompany manuscripts discussing the biosafety, the biosecurity, the, the risk-benefit analyses that were taken to convey uh, how responsible the, uh, the investigators and, and the process was. Uh, there would be the possibility, perhaps, of, of, of publishing uh, the, the important uh, beneficial findings in a general sense, but, but maybe not, not details, et cetera. So there, there's, there's an entire continuum to consider, and again, these are, these are also not black and white, uh, but um, they, they do sort of uh, help along that, that process. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Maybe it just complicates things. But I think it, uh, there are a lot of options, both in the consideration and the communication stages. Um, please, Mark. Uh, uh, just a couple things. I hope to sort of randomly address both, both questions. Uh, the one about the dual use of concerns, it's sort of like another a famous area where some, a judge would say, I, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, and again, it comes back to, I think, the practical, the practical idea, and in, in in I, I call it my IBC, I'm a little proprietary. In our IBC, um, we'll have times when, rightfully so, people are fed up with someone who's non-compliant or they're not responding or they're not giving the information, they want to off them, you know, and uh, just say no and, and close something down. And, and my response is always, no, we don't need to say no, I need to go have lunch with them. 
and, and sit and talk about why they're not responding, what the issues are in their research, and how the committee can facilitate their research and they can facilitate our work and how they can quit causing trouble for us. Um, and I feel kind of the same way about this institution at, at Vanderbilt that is, is, you know, is continually striving, increasing its, its research funding and other major research institutions, perhaps here and around the world. I think we should, should still be able to say, probably right off the top of our head on two hands, uh, who the investigators are that might have research that would potentially move into this area. Uh, I don't think there's any surprises about the people that work on pathogenesis research if we're broadly defining it mainly in that category. And so to have those conversations ahead of time, perhaps in terms of even helping with design and helping understand what, what's the thing, and also about this issue that you all have talked about before and published about the thing of self-regulation uh, self and self-censoring, right, in terms of experiments that might in fact be important to do that never get done because the person's afraid they're going to get regulated from the top and told they can't do it. And so I, I propose that that, um, the education is more of a practical issue of sitting down and saying, what areas in your research you think are most profound? Which ones do you think you would like to do, but you're afraid someone would tell you you can't do it? What are the processes that we can put in place to find the people to help you to facilitate that research in a way that's safe, that gives you a process and can be communicated in a way to facilitate, uh, facilitate public health? So that's kind of my, uh, my take on, on how we incorporate process and how we avoid the issue of sort of dual use being actually a restricting terminology rather than an enabling one. Um, is yours on the same topic or a new topic? New topic. New topic. Um, panel members, any other comments on the, the two uh, questions and statements from the floor? Michael. Yeah, I'll maybe say something in response to Gerald Epstein's comments, and I think it, it, it brings back the idea of the dual-use pipeline, and, and we can't rely on, you know, any one kind of intervention at any one place in that pipeline. So increasing awareness and education of scientists, that would do good. Um, there would be, you know, more research that's done with better benefit risk profiles, and there would be less experiments done. There would be less um, studies published where the risks are likely to greatly outweigh the benefits. But it wouldn't be a, a, a cure-all of the problem of dual use to have more education and awareness because, you know, not all scientists are going to be angels even if, you know, we do a lot more in the way of education. And, you know, there are other malevolent actors that could use, you know, malevolent results of dual use research that was worth doing and worth publishing. So there need to be other kinds of things in place to prevent harmful use of uh, scientific uh, discoveries and, and technology and so forth. And so a web of prevention is what we need, not just um, increased awareness, education, and responsibility of scientists. That's all well and good, but I think what we've heard today is that sometimes you get a surprising result, which is a threat that you haven't known about. And I guess uh, the awareness, Jerry, in the education is the fact that this kind of work can appear. It uh, may or may not be the focus or involve the focus of the research come out of it. But the, we've all agreed that it's uh, generally the malevolent scientist who's not represented that is doing or taking advantage of it. So we're protecting ourselves that way as well as instructing or making the scientists themselves more aware. We have about a minute or two left, and this gentleman's been waiting, and we can, we'll take the time to introduce maybe a different topic. Just for two minutes, <laughs> yes. It won't take even two minutes. Um, my name is Herb Lin, and I am staff at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and I would be, we would be delighted to entertain a proposal from someone uh, accompanied by funding uh, to uh, address some of the issues that you're talking about in conjunction with uh, other uh, academies of science around the world. So I will come up afterwards and take business cards. Um, <laughs> The substantive question that I have it builds on the fact that this is an international panel, uh, and I was wondering if there are any differences at all in the kinds of perspectives and concerns that you have about dual use 
uh, sorts of issues um, that are obvious between the two, b between the uh, the United States and uh, the Pacific uh, and Asian nations. If, if I can interrupt just briefly, this is a wonderful way that we had thought we would end the session, and that is to go around and individuals mention what the most important take they have. They can include your question, which is, how does my country differ from yours? So um, you agreed, co-chair, on this? Will you start, Jeff, and just say what, what cogent point, what would well, you leave the audience and us with as we move uh, well, to the reception. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, um, we, we, certainly on the NSABB, have thought a lot about these issues. Um, I'm really encouraged to hear how much thought and consideration is obviously going on elsewhere, and just very curious to learn about diverse approaches and possibly solutions to these problems, which are, are very difficult. Uh, even with communication tools. And so we look forward to, uh, to the deliberations of, of, uh, of our colleagues. Thank you. Next. Um, Dr. Kim. Uh, actually, the, uh, India scientists uh, still uh, are far from uh, actually appreciating uh, this problem as such. But uh, from security, we have an uh, organization, National Disaster Management Authority, and uh, our prime minister is the chairman of that uh, particular organization. In addition to dealing with various other disasters, such as you know natural disasters, uh, bioterrorism through uh, this is one of the key uh, issues they are really concerned about, and uh, they have started voicing them since last six months. Actually, we have, we have had two workshops uh, conducted only on this thing, and in fact, that was one of the best interfaces we had, where we had researchers and people from army intelligence and the, the, we, have, we had around 15 different organizations from including the homeland security and everybody was involved in that customs and everybody was involved in that and that was one of the issues which was actually discussed now the thing is uh, one of the things that they asked actually uh, to the scientists was what what are your concerns you know and then in addition to uh, 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 except for the fact that uh, they discussed about uh, you know accidental release of uh, these pathogens in this thing, they, they, they actually didn't come up with this, and this is how you know the, maybe this particular thing we we can now put it out across to them that okay this is one area of concern where we should start working at. Very good, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, the universities or uh, research areas, uh, biosafety, I think they're willing to do it. Biosecurity, they are barely meet the government requirement uh, because uh, all the budget to be used for biosecurity, research laboratory, they have to manage their own. So that's the problem. But for uh, dual use uh, research concern, I think uh, we need a little more time. Uh, let them prepare. Thank you. Ian? Regarding education, obviously, in Australia, we try to introduce this Bradford uh, approach to uh, educating our researchers. It was a wonderfully trialed, uh, short period of time. We tried to get more funding from the government, and that failed. So it's pretty dead in the water in that way. We've tried to get online, and we are developing online modules at universities, uh, online modules, uh, modules for biosafety, but we're trying to get online modules that they have to sit and pass for uh, dual-use dilemmas. So that's another, uh, and obviously the academy approaches, which again uh, fell into shallow water, and we haven't sailed away yet. Thank you, Dave. I, uh, we've talked about trust a little bit here today. I think trust is very important uh, between science and society, has, as has been mentioned, within our science community, within our own labs, and then internationally. And uh, sort of touching on Jerry's point, uh, this is a dangerous world. We're never going to make it perfectly safe either. The way to make a laboratory safe is to turn out the lights and close the doors and unplug the freezers and let weeds grow in the parking lot. And we're not willing to do that either. Uh, I do like awareness and education almost as a, as a process. Uh, and sometimes the process and the communication that goes on around a process like that is, 
is as valuable as the product that we intend to come from it. But I especially like Mark Dennison's idea of going to lunch. Uh, and I think, you know, going to lunch globally is a good thing, too. We can all work together and, and learn together as we eat together. Thank you. Amy? Well, I've been inspired by the, the, the dialogues around, around the table. I think I'm coming away with a, a keen sense that um, colleagues uh, around the world are um, struggling with this issue just as we are. Uh, I think it's very clear that a determination about dual use research of concern is at the end of the day a judgment call. And it, it's not as easy as saying, well, this is human subjects, this is recombinant DNA, and so it automatically uh, falls into an oversight system. It's also a judgment not about one's own intent, but about the intents of, of others and speculation about what they might do with a body of work. It's an assessment about the intrinsic nature of the research. Is it increasing transmissibility? Is it altering host range? But it's also an assessment of extrinsic factors. Are treatments available? How readily accessible is the technology? How easy is it to produce? Um, so I think if the answers were easy, we would all have them by now. Um, and I, and that probably sounds mundane, but um, so I just hope that as we work together and, and really um, move forward collectively in this dialogue, that we don't lose sight of a couple of things. One, the public trust is incredibly important, and I think the extent to which these dialogues can happen in an open forum, it's very important. Um, number two, I think it's really easy to say no. When, when you confront risk and potential liability, like, well, who gave permission for this experiment to go forward? It's very easy just to say no to science, and that's certainly not the position that we want to get ourselves into. Science needs to move forward. Um, so we have to figure out a way to make these difficult judgment calls in a way that can stand up to public scrutiny and that makes sense to the scientific community um, and is very workable in very diverse settings and is not a one-size-fits-all approach. Thank you. So Um, so Singapore is kind of in a unique uh, position, I think, because we are a very small nation um, surrounded by uh, bigger neighbors. And um, we have experienced, of course, uh, SARS. And um, out of that came um, a lot of controls that weren't there before and a very high level of awareness, particularly with regards to bio-risk reduction um, around uh, bo both biosafety and, bio uh, and infection control. Um, the other element of Singapore is that it's a highly, I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a highly organized um, society. And um, <laughs> I guess that's sort of an understatement, but, um, but it, in a sense, the, the, the dual use issues often just um, automatically get put under kind of a bio uh, defense uh, approach and, and within the co confines of bio defense uh, research. And um, there are legal constraints um, around conducting uh, research around specific pathogens that are identified um, by, by the government. And so therefore, there, there are kind of clear, uh, I guess I'd say criteria probably that, that, that present, and not necessarily that um, the research couldn't be conducted, but it would be controlled in a sense in terms of the control of materials, um, the knowledge of what a specific, every specific individual is doing with that type of research. Um, and interestingly, on the other side of the coin, outside of the defensive issue, is, is the fact that it's a very, um, it takes a very open approach towards just, uh, just the, the ability to do types, other types of research that um, might have been in other 
societies being um, censured or found uh, morally uh, worrisome. Um, and perhaps those of you who, who, who look at this uh, know that um, some, uh, when Singapore invested uh, heavily in its biotechnology sector um, to, uh, to encourage uh, economic development and, and develop itself as a biotechnology hub, um, actually there, there are some very prominent scientists who are felt that they were uh, not able to do the kinds of research they wanted to do um, where they were originally from, who, who, who are in Singapore doing those kinds of research. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting as we talk about all the different um, uh, priorities of research and desires and objectives of researchers that, that, that again, there is this spectrum of, of, of research um, considerations just uh, beyond the, the, the dual use that, that needs to be considered. Thank you. Two very brief points uh, in closing from me. Uh, one is do lunch. But the recommendation is do lunch from the academic community with somebody from the security community. Because when you do, you might find that some of the supposed unknown unknowns or some of the known unknowns are in fact known but by someone else. And that goes both ways is that this, the, the, the security community needs the academic community and vice versa. Couldn't agree more, do lunch, but do it with the other tribe. That'd be great. My second, my second and my final point is, as a person who works in policy, one of the guiding principles for me in this very gray and difficult space is when I imagine that in Australia, we have some technology which has got into the wrong hands and has resulted in a 1,000 people dead, and there is a royal commission, will I be able to give a defence to say that the government has acted responsibly? That, I find, sharpens my mind on these issues. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. So I'm an American citizen and an Australian citizen. I think Ian and Rob have already spoken on behalf of Australia, so I might speak as a global citizen. And I think it's great that the United States has taken such a leading role on the issue of dual use, as you know, illustrated by the, the activities, the important activities of the NSABB, and that's a great thing. But it's important to, to recognize that there's no domestic solution to dual use problems. You know, if uh, one country is, you know, wants to prevent certain research from happening or getting published, then, you know, and maybe research that shouldn't happen or get published, then, you know, the scientists could do it or publish it elsewhere. And if, if the country is too restrictive about uh, certain research getting um, done or getting published that should get done and get published, then, you know, the rest of the world is, is deprived of the benefits of that research. The benefits of dual-use dual research affect global public health and the dangers and the harms of dual-use research affect global public health. It's a global issue, so there really needs to be you know, global governance of it. So I would hope that an organization like the WHO, whose you know, the mandate of which is uh, global, global public health, will take more of, of a role in this area and you know, establish bodies like the NSABB, but at more of an international level. As you know, WHO has been a partner with uh, NSABB, the International Working Group, on this area, and I think it, we've always, from the beginning, known it's been important. Dr. Sudoya. Indonesia has a very diverse population, so uh, education standard is not similar. Culture is different, meaning that acceptance is also different from one region to another. So it is high, uh, very important that uh, we realize the role of Indonesian Academy of Science. It is a highly respective uh, entity or institution, so the approach through the institution, through the Indonesian Academy of Science, will assure that it will be accepted, not only by the government, by, uh, the, uh, but also by uh, people from uh, many different uh, fields. Uh, I think that's, that's the key uh, of the uh, dual-use research and biosafety, biosecurity uh, success in Indonesia. 
the training model that we are going, we will translate, will, will become also the priority uh, of the Indonesian Biorex Association beside producing some uh, SOP guidelines, etc. So I think uh, it is a kind of a message that we are going, uh, we would like to uh, emphasize here. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I believe I have very little that I haven't said. Just uh, one, um, in this whole process that we need to be sure that scientists and in institutions are not ruled or making decisions based on fear of an unknown they can't predict. Second, that all the stakeholders, uh, in my opinion, that are actively engaged want high, significant high-impact science that will help public health. And third, we need to be sure that in this process that we are encouraging the future Enders, Robbins, Wellers of our day and of the future. I find it very gratifying that in the years since the Fink report, um, we've learned, we've demonstrated today that the conversation about dual use research of concern uh, is real, that it's not a US centric or sole problem, that there is a global scientific community that needs to be engaged and, in fact, is engaged. Um, I think we've demonstrated today and had comments from the audience to um, validate that the case study approach is a pinpoint way of trying to very effectively communicate exactly from the lessons learned what the issues are and how to approach the future, including more time at lunch. Um, I think that although we've talked about potential value, um, a utopian view of everyone being knowledgeable and aware and whatnot, perhaps the important next steps would be more targeted education um, within each country, identify, find the, the, the life science research thought leaders who are most likely to be engaged in the kind of research that might have dual use research of concern implications and make sure that they, in fact, are having a dialogue and are engaged and are aware that somebody else may know things that they don't know that they can contribute to understanding potential um, uh, dual use research of concern um, requirements or, or the thinking about the dialogue such as we're having. I'll take a moment to say that the Americans here might know that there is an, ex an advertisement for publicity for just do lunch. It means something quite different. It's a dating service. I didn't know that. Well, that's why I thought I'd mention it. I'd change it around a little. For the record, I still don't know that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Scientific, academic, economic, or any uh, environment in each country is definitely different from each other. And the environment in which we live is always changing uh, time to time. For instance, the WHO is aiming to eradicate polio or measles virus infections. And smallpox has already been eradicated from the globe. According to the situations, uh, the dual use research concern issues is always changing. So education or the sharing information on the issue of the dual use research concern is always changing. So uh, we have, uh, I believe that the continued effort uh, to share the information on the dual use research concern is very required uh, to promote the, uh, our society, make to, to make our society uh, more safe or safe. And um, I believe that uh, sharing the information or promotion of the recognition of the dual use research concern in the scientific field is required a globe, uh, in a manner of global. And uh, fi my final comment is that uh, destruction of the information is, might, might be effective to uh, make a society safe, but also the keyword for the promotion of the safety society is uh, transparency. Transparency might be uh, become, uh, might become a keyword for the promotion of the dual use research concern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huang, we're still 
hearing from you, I hope. Are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. So would you give a short comment on what you're taking from this meeting? Yeah. Where you want to leave I, for the meeting? You know, uh, I just make some point about the biosafety regulation. And, uh, you know, in China, we have, after the laboratory acquired uh, infection in 2000, 2003, a lot of regulation, law, code have been issued for biosafety and biosecurity management of laboratory and pathogen transfer or stalking or something else. But nowadays there's no regulation on the dual use identification and uh, classification of some sensible information. And I think uh, maybe in later, uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese scientific community, uh, community were focus on the discussion in this this matter and especially in the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, we began to discuss about the um, scientific ethics on the synthetic biology and in last month we have a seminar on the nanoscience and the synthetic biology and the plant uh, uh, transgenetic plants. So I think uh, the future for us uh, is to establish uh, the philosophy for dual use research and uh, establishment of a regulation system on this point. Thank this you. is my point. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. All right, this concludes the formal part of the meeting. In that sense, actually, we're moving to even more formal because we're going to hear from three. Uh, high-ranking individuals who will give some concluding remarks. We'll start first with Dave. Thank you, Stuart. Well, this has been fun. Uh, this has been especially enjoyable to meet many old friends from, from the uh, Asia-Pacific region today. And it's been a really good opportunity, I think, to reflect on, on uh, dual-use research and dual-use research of concern and to consider the different management strategies that are used uh, uh, globally. I hope this, uh, this approach has been thought-provoking and that our discussions have been enlightening. I really think they have. Uh, I think it has shown that, uh, that no one solution uh, fits all our needs and that none of us has all the answers, uh, no matter where we come from. I also think it's underscored the value of working together internationally. I knew that before we got here, by the way, but uh, uh, on hard problems that can impact all of us. I want to particularly thank our two presenters uh, that gave the, gave the papers, were the senior authors, as well as my colleagues from Asia and the Western Pacific region, particularly Dr. Yuan, who now has to get up and go to work well, we go to dinner and go home and go to bed. Thank uh, you. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe you can have a nap during the day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're and, right. And our colleagues uh, from the United States, and particularly here, Stuart, my, uh, my co-chair of this international working group, and uh, there are a number of our working group in the, in the audience as well. I think we've learned a great deal, and I'm certain that our experience will inform our future thinking on the International Working Group and the NSABB as a whole, and uh, hopefully inform uh, our future international engagement activities. And I hope that we can all continue to work together for the good of all our citizens. So uh, with that, I thank you for, for coming, and I turn to Dr. Zari. Um, thank you, Dave. Um, I also, I guess, second your comments, um, and I um, will just add that um, I think one of the last questions brought up uh, the issue of the ideal world if we promoted education and um, uh, knowledge and we were all um, well educated and, and, and all that, would we be safer? And I guess my answer is I think this is part of the process that I, I think we will be safer. And I think in a way all these events as they, they, they happen and evolve um, and our responses to them is kind of a way of um, 
I don't know, organically coming up with, with a response that makes sense. Um, yes, it might not be one size fits all, but maybe, a, again, coming back to common principles, I mean, uh, some of the, the uh, principles that currently guide uh, research conception, research conduct that protect um, uh, Public, the public, from 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 these uh, from potentially dangerous endeavors, also emerged or organically as as a response to to situations, and so I I, I think um, in the end with these continuing dialogues and events like this, and engaging further just just beyond kind of us and the usual suspects and um, that that it's that's that's really an, an important thing and I, I hope that um, these types of um, efforts will will continue to have support. Um, because I think that's that's uh, that's a critical piece of, of uh, making us safer. Thank you. Now, last remarks from our leader, Amy Patterson. All right. This will be very brief. Um, first, a uh, little bit of loft, and then very mundane. So the loft is a heartfelt th heartfelt thanks um, to each and every one of our our guests. Uh, here today. I really appreciate you traveling long distances uh, to be here. I think we're all um, very, very honored to have had you here and uh, to have shared with you uh, your experiences. I want to also want to say that I think there are some significant challenges that lie ahead of all of us in the uh, coming months. I think we will as research presses forward, we'll have plenty of examples to, to work together and I think this has set a very nice foundation. Um, I was given the task of um, telling everyone who's registered for this meeting and participated that we will be entering your names in a contest. No, we're entering <laughs> your names and contact information into um, our network, our LIFSERV, on for dual use research uh, international uh, network of communication. And we use this network to send out uh, information about upcoming events. Again, this meeting was one of a, a series um, that we've done, and we'd like to notify you of future activities. If you don't want to belong, you can. Um, there's a way you can select and, and not belong, um, but we really hope that you'll continue to partner with us. Also, um, we'll, we'll, we'll use the listserv, or you could just go to our website to find out when the um, uh, recording of this meeting is available uh, on the internet. And of course, if you have any questions or concerns in the meantime, please let us know. And then finally, um, please join us for some light refreshments uh, in the reception area um, out there. And this will give you an opportunity to talk again with one another for the participants to ask questions. And again, many, many thanks to all of you um, for making this possible. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm not supposed to make concluding remarks, but I do want to thank Stuart Nightingale and Aaron Lukemeyer and their group on behalf of the International Working Group for all the efforts to put this together. I think we all agree it was a huge success. Thank you all, and thank you everybody else. <laughs>